How's everybody doing out there? Are we having fun? The things that we do in our built realm really help encourage the creation of what I call a culture of activity. And my journey really you know, is in the sciences. I started out uh, being passionate about wanting to create uh, healthy lifestyles for individuals. The first, first, first 15 years of my career, uh, after graduating uh, from you know, exercise science uh, at, at the undergraduate level at USC, then going on to the University of Michigan and focusing in on uh, public health, and disease prevention in the school of kinesiology. And then believe it or not, a, a third of my coursework in the MBA program in the business school there at Michigan. And the reason why is because I had this vision that if we really wanted to improve the health and well-being of our population, we had to go to where the payers were, the people who were actually funding our health and well-being. And believe it or not, that's most often in our society, it's our corporations. Most of us have our health insurance through our businesses. If we work for a large institution, uh, which is what I was focusing in on, I was designing programs for Fortune 500 companies. And did you know that they are actually self-insured? So every single heart attack, every single high blood pressure hits their bottom line. They have a vested interest in having a healthy population. So these are populations, these are communities. And so what I was doing for the first 10, 15 years of my career was designing health promotion programs in that environment, on their corporate campuses. And, you know, because they had, again, a vested interest for, you know, having a healthier population. I got a little burned out on all of that and uh, moved from where I was living at the time, which is Boulder, Colorado, to Honolulu, Hawaii. <laughs> yeah, Honolulu, Hawaii. I, you know, I was a triathlete at the time, just like Victor is a, a former Ironman distance triathlete. And I was moving there because I wanted to have endless uh, summer. I wanted to have the ability to train for triathlon uh, all year round. I got to Honolulu and realized it wasn't what I thought it was. It was paradise, but it was a very, very hostile environment. And so that was, you know, sort of integral to my journey that I had there. So again, you know, from disease prevention and then starting to look at urbanism, that was my wake up call. And I then shifted my focus on our built environment. How do we create environments that encourage healthy physical activity naturally? Not athleticism, not becoming an athlete, not sport, but really how do we encourage walkability day in and day out and being able to you know, get around by walking and biking? And so I made that shift. You know, about 18 years ago, and really started to focus in on how I can uh, inspire, promote, and advocate for healthier communities to be developed. And uh, yeah, and this is, this is the journey that I have been on. And, and really, that is my mission. My mission is to help promote and create a culture of activity. And I'm doing this now, you know, really at a global level. And the reason why is because <laughs> I like to joke about this and say, yeah, I'm a health promotion professional, been in the business for about 34 years now, turned uh, YouTuber. <laughs> and, that's, and, and that's quite honest, is that I started to realize that the things that we are talking about in urbanism and the things that we are talking about in public health are issues that really have an international audience. And so uh, I started a podcast uh, during the pandemic. Many of us did shift during the pandemic. And one of the things that I did was start a podcast, which very, very quickly uh, evolved into the YouTube channel. So this is how you can find me. I'm, I'm producing content every single week, uh, at least one podcast episode, and I'm looking out across the audience here, and I see at least half a dozen or more uh, former guests on the podcast. I'm looking at you, Mike, and Victor, and Joe, and I really appreciate it. So when we think about you know, creating a culture of activity, let's, let's define this just a little bit. 
And this goes back to part of my journey too. So I moved from Chicago to Boulder. And when I did that, I noticed that there was something really, really special about Boulder. It seemed like there was this concept of a culture of activity. Activity was ingrained in literally every aspect of their life. Uh, and, it, and it just sort of exuded. Now, I didn't have, at the time, I didn't have the words to really describe it or uh, and really process it because it was prior to the epiphany of me moving from Boulder to Honolulu. And then that's when the, you know, then it really started to sink in for me. But I came back to Boulder and really realized that, you know, that's one of the quintessential things that we think about. And we think about a place that just really does exude a culture of activity. And so it, it's just that. It, it, it really is something where it permeates through all aspects of life. And people are just really encouraged to do it naturally and organically. Okay, so let's define activity. There's many different types of activity. Obviously, there is uh, organized activity and things that we might call working out. You know, that's exercise with a capital E. As well as, you know, recreation and play, getting out there and uh, having a good time and, and doing something for sport and recreation. This particular shot is actually in Boulder, Colorado. And when I snapped the shot, I had to just laugh because it, these are actually a co-workers out on, an, on a midday ride. And while they're riding and having a hoot doing it, they're also talking about a work project. So I guess you could actually say this is an active work meeting. And, uh, and that's what I mean by exudes through all aspects of life. They have integrated activity right into their, their daily meetings. I guess that's an active meeting, too. And then there's also hobbies, you know, going out and hiking and, and birding and gardening. These are all types of activity that we have out there. But there's also meditative movement. This is a, a beautiful park in the 12th arrondissement in Paris. And, you know, it's one of the things that I've noticed here at Seaside is there's plenty of opportunities. Right behind me here is a, is a nature area, and many of the little bits of nature that have been preserved have little winding pathways through it. And if you haven't had that chance to do it, please explore and, and really understand how powerful that is. The meditative aspect of, you know, really meditation in motion, being able to get into nature and just take a quick, quick deep breath and realize how refreshing that really is for our health and well-being and our soul. And then, of course, there's active mobility, helping us get to the places that we need and want to go to under our own power, including these kids in Boulder being able to get to a school project and program that's going on, being able to have comfortable streets, separated bikeways, protected bike paths. These are the types of things that really help support culture of activity. So, but there's the 800 pound gorilla in the room. <laughs> okay. When we think about a culture of activity, we have to take into consideration that we have a rather interesting relationship with activity and movement. On one hand, it's the most natural thing that we do as a species. Okay. I've been watching the kids playing in the, the green area, the lawn area, <laughs> right now, in fact. Uh, it's, it's just natural for us to be active and moving. But, yeah, we're hardwired to have a lazy gene. We're hardwired to be a bit slothful. How many people have seen this photo before? Yeah. This is a classic photo. Um, it, it was shot in uh, the San Diego area almost two decades ago. I have an update for you. This is late breaking news. Uh, it still happens today. So this is uh, just about a month ago at uh, the Transportation Research uh, Board meeting in Washington, DC. Show of hands, anybody at the TRB this year? Yeah, in the back there. 
uh, Darren Buck actually shot this this photo, and what I love about it is not only is it just the ride up, I get it, those are a lot of steps, but if you look on the other side to the far left of the screen, you'll see on the way down, there's, there's also a whole bunch of people going down. So they're not even taking advantage of the fact that this is a really beautiful stairway, um, but they won't even use the gravity to, to help get them down. So that's our challenge, right? Is that we are both, you know, we're, we're able to do incredible things from a, from a physical activity perspective. It comes natural to us. We know that it's good for us, but we do have that sort of natural instinct to try to conserve energy. So what does that mean for us building communities? Well, we may need to actually make it incredibly easy to take the active choice, to choose to be active. And that word easy is something that we can work with. We know how to do that. But we also know that we have actually designed activity out of our lives. And this, of course, is another classic shot from the movie WALL-E of where activity, physical activity, just gets uh, you know, completely worked out of our lives and then disease, dis-ease, takes hold. Okay, so. Along comes the exercise physiologist slash uh, health behaviorist that I am, and I'm getting into uh, the urbanism movement, uh, a, a, I guess about almost 15 years ago, and I start seeing the world through this different lens, this lens of activity assets. Uh, this is a terminology that I use that, that basically says, you know, hey, what are we doing out there that is helping to promote and support a culture of activity. And so I divide activity assets into uh, a familiar sort of breakdown. We, you know, even Andreas uh, mentioned hardware and software yesterday in his little uh, stand-up, is this, the hardware of activity assets and the software of activity assets. The hardware, of course, are the facilities, the things in the, the physical realm, and then the software is the programming. Uh, when we look at the software side of things, these are, you know, this is the policies and the planning and the programs that are out there. Uh, and these are very, very critical aspects of paving the way for what our communities end up looking like. And I want to say this, is that these inherently end up becoming political decisions. And oftentimes, and, and I don't mean that in a negative way, but it's, it's the reality. Oftentimes these decisions are binary choices based on limited resources. It's either an up or a down. It's either going to happen or it's not going to happen. It's either going to be implemented or it's going to sit on a shelf, maybe for a couple of decades. The other thing that we see in this realm of the programming are the activities that we do that help engage and educate and create awareness out there in our built environment. This is from Viva Streets this past summer in Denver, Colorado. And really, it was you know, a wonderful opportunity to bring the, the, the community out and, and help to you know, kind of reframe what are, what are our streets for? Are, are our streets simply an auto sewer, or are they for people? And how many out there have open streets events uh, in their communities? Raise, raise your hands up really high. I want everybody to be able to see that. Thank you. Uh, these are incredible events, incredible activities that really help reframe people's minds of what our streets are for. Okay. Let's get to the hardware, activity assets. These are our parks that are out there. This is a wonderful shot of a beautiful park in the Wheeler District in Oklahoma City. And what's really, really amazing about this shot is when I took it, when I snapped this shot, uh, I rode my bike from the downtown area of Oklahoma City over a beautiful bridge and down to a wonderful bike path right up to this spot. In other words, I was able to ride my bike all the way from downtown Oklahoma City to this particular destination. And if you haven't seen the Wheeler District, uh, I have a wonderful video on my YouTube channel. <laughs> but it's also one of the Dover Coal uh, communities. And so be sure to click through their projects and check that out. It's a lot of fun. 
it's it's also our pools. These are absolutely critical and beloved activity assets. This is an activity asset that I can walk to. I live in this neighborhood. This is the Barton Springs Pool. How many of you have been to the Barton Springs Pool? Yes. It is an absolute joy. They, they talk about, it's, a, it's been around for over 100 years, I believe now, and uh, it, they call it the healing waters. There's something magical about a spring-fed pool. It's also, though, our protected bikeways and our separated bikeways. These are absolutely essential activity assets, as well as something as boring as bike parking and comfort facilities. These are absolutely essential sort of activity assets that just blend into the background and we don't even think about them. But if they're not there, it starts to become friction. It starts to become the types of things that people are irritated by. And they're like, gosh, I can't maintain this habit that I'm trying to maintain, which is to be a little bit more active on a regular basis, naturally. The other thing that we see is that you know, even businesses end up becoming activity assets, activity promoting retail establishments like this bike shop here in South Maine, another Dover Coal community. These are absolutely essential places that help support a culture of activity. Uh, bike shops and running shoe stores and outdoor gear shops, these are the hubs of communities that help support people uh, to learn how to do certain activities, like learning how to ride a bike, and, and even mundane things like, you know, maybe this is how you network with a group that can show you, hey, it's, it's possible to actually get groceries with your bicycle. Let me show you. Let me see how to do that. And this is one of the things that uh, bike shops and advocacy organizations that run out of bike shops frequently uh, can help do for a community. So yes, even retail establishments are activity assets in my mind. And people-oriented streets. You're going to you know, hear in just a little bit from John Massingale and also from Victor about the street design book. And we look at streets as, you know, really, I think in our world, we look at streets as something more than just getting from A to B. Okay? These are essential places for us to gather. And it doesn't have to be you know, a, a situation where, you know, you're, you're just flowing through that space. And we'll, we'll notice that in just a moment. But I want to end here with also saying that, you know, it's these activity assets are things such as, you know, greenways and pathways and trails. How, how many of you have been riding a bike around the seaside area? A couple of hands, okay, a few. So yesterday I got here and I, I jumped on my bike and I rode um, up into the state forest up on you know the highway 395. And did you all notice if you came down that way that there's a, there's a bike path there? There's a wonderful separated bike path there. And it's, again, these are the types of activity assets that make the difference when we're talking about building communities that can help support a culture of activity and that's why I consider these essential activity assets. Okay, so all this being said, active towns are walkable, obvious. They are also bikeable places, okay? And they're fun, they're whimsical, they're memorable. These are places that stick with us. All you have to do is look at the, the, the square and see everybody milling around and coming uh, you know, to this environment. This happens to be Pearl Street in Boulder, and uh, we've got a, a busker doing some fun stuff. Doesn't show up really well. I don't think he's actually juggling um, uh, chainsaws at this point. I think it might just be torches. But it's fun. But these are also social places, even for our furry friends. And yes, this is Paris. But they're lovable, too. This is the car-free island of Mackinac Island in Michigan. If you haven't been, it's worth it. It is lovable. And it's also, these are livable places. So active towns are truly livable places. Our only problem is this. We don't have enough of them. So the research that had been done a few years ago 
by Nike in their Design to Move uh, program, which is a project uh, that was uh, really co-coordinated with the Active Living Institute. Uh, that is with the University of California, San Diego. Jim Salas was the professor um, that really drove that uh, research. And yeah, not surprisingly, <laughs> these places are you know, wonderful places. We know that they are healthier, wealthier. They are really, truly, you know, desirable places. They're safer. They're more cohesive. These are all attributes that people, uh, you know, want. And, again, not surprisingly, people are happier when they're in these places. So, this is what we know. People do want to be in these places. But... We need to figure out how we can create more of them. And when I look out on this audience, that's exactly what you are doing. Some of you are doing it, you know, like with Seaside from the ground up. Some of you are doing certain parts in, uh, of that process, but this is what you're, you're helping to do. But just to go through a few things as to what it, how you go about doing it, how you can create it. We have to prioritize active mobility. We have to set aside the resources and the funds necessary to design, build, and maintain these active activity assets, okay? Maintain, again, they, we, we end, oftentimes we have the money to design them and to build them, and then we forget about maintaining them. So it is incredibly important that that is part of that. So you see what's happening here too, is that we see that marrying of the hardware activity assets and the software activity assets, because part of making it work long-term is you have to have the systems in place and the programs in place and the funding in place to maintain and manage that process. You also have to look at what your current built environment is and be a little bit creative and jump in and say, you know what, let's do a little bit of tactical urbanism uh, and, and, and try to shape this environment and make it a little less car centric. You know, oh my gosh, this is literally a school zone in Seville, Spain, and this is what they've done to try to make it a little bit safer and more inviting for all of those kids that are coming to the school area, the schoolyard. And we need to like think about, okay, what are the resources that we have in our environment? Do we have an old abandoned railway? Do we have a utility corridor that can be activated? These are ideas that can be you know, really taken advantage of. You try to leverage those opportunities that exist out there. And the next one is bold projects. Is really looking at game-changing policies and game-changing infrastructure that you can put in place. This particular photo is what I call an iconic shot in uh, Austin, Texas, which is where I live. And it, it is the place where people will pose for photos and for selfies. And why? Because this walking and biking bridge is an absolutely uh, beloved activity asset connecting people from the south side of the city into the downtown area. So if we build it, will they come? And the answer is absolutely, they will come if and only if we build the right it, okay? And then follow it up and maintain and promote and engage. So building it is not enough, but it's the absolutely essential start. Okay, so what's the right it? Well, the minimum design is it has to be safe and inviting for everyone. I'll say that again. It has to be safe and inviting for everybody, all ages and all abilities. And this is what we mean by all ages here. We want it to be something that's truly inviting across four generations to be able to get out and walk and bike and have natural activity in their communities. And all abilities. I mean, it, it, it has to be like an environment where we know that as you know, time goes by and we may have limited mobility and you know, opportunities and needs, we have the ability to get around. And so a truly safe and inviting environment looks more like this. 
Now, we are creatures of habit, okay? And a lot of what we've been talking about is behavior change and, and really setting up environments that help support living a healthy, active lifestyle. And as you know, creatures of habit, we, we gravitate towards places that are, you know, that are comfortable and convenient. And when I look at this particular image here, you might just see a bike lane. But really what I see is an activity asset that makes it easy for everyone, all ages and all abilities, to be able to participate in life in an empowering way. And so it becomes not just a bike lane, it becomes really an empowerment tool for everyone in our community. And we're looking at creating invitations, not dares. Okay, I'd really thinking about this as an environment that really invites people to get off their couches and out of their doors and out of their cars and being able to really participate in life fully through activity. Another Dover Cole design. And this is a, a, an example, too, of when we think about behavior change and supporting communities uh, and, and trying to create a societal culture of activity, we think about how do we reduce frictions. And so when I think of weather and change, I mean, I'm in Austin, Texas. It's, it, with global warming, it is getting absolutely miserable <laughs> at times in the summertime. But then we also have, you know, places like Buffalo, New York, and this is in Boulder, Colorado. We also get winter and snow. But if you have a safe and inviting, you know, environment for people to be able to continue to participate in active mobility, they will do so. Just like this little kiddo who rides every single day to school because he has a safe place to do it. And this we look at where our gaps are and thinking about bridging the gaps in our active mobility networks like we have here in the Coulee Verte in Paris. And here, connecting our communities. Again, that pathway on 395. I'm able to, was able to ride my bike from here, you know, on the pathway, jump onto that pathway, get to the grocery store, and it's like, oh yeah, we're, we're connecting our communities through you know, these types of facilities. And this particular facility connects re some communities in a rural area in, in Denmark. And we can be doing these things too. And thinking about getting back to human scale. And there's a few things that I wanna say about you know, that and the most important thing that I want to emphasize with this particular slide is the 10-minute campaign. 10-minute campaign, how many people know about the 10-minute campaign from the Trust of Public Lands? Yes. Essentially, the 10-minute campaign is really to ensure that every single resident in the United States is within 10-minute walk of a park, an open space, a trail, some form of nature, activity assets. And and I would also add on to that saying that within a three to five minute bike ride too, because it also should be safe for somebody to be able to get on their bike and make it over to there as well. So you've been hearing me go on and on and on about the, this concept of activity assets and creating a culture of activity. And when we as behaviorists look at habit creation and what it really takes to change culture. Earlier, Alan talked about how uh, they wanted to change culture to change the built environment. And here I've been talking about changing the built environment to help support and change culture. And one of the things that happens at the individual level when we think about creating um, habits is what happens you know, when we do something repetitively, persistently, and it's a pleasurable activity, we create something called a positive neural loop. We're actually establishing within our brains and changing our brains to the point where it becomes second nature. It's now second nature for me, after many, many years of doing it, to simply get on my bike and ride to the grocery store wouldn't even consider getting in the car. 
I have a car, but fortunately I don't need to get into it very often. I can jump on the bike and go and run my daily needs and errands by doing that. I've created a habit. And that's what we want to do with our communities, create the ability to have positive, healthy habits just like this. This is, again, the Wheeler District, by the way, in Oklahoma City. And this is a delightful little cut-through path that uh, I, I don't know if, if Victor actually named this or not. But uh, it, it's, it's delightful. And I noticed here in Seaside, too, there's, all, there's an entire labyrinth of pathways, pedestrian pathways, that go through. And it really helps support this concept of creating a culture of activity and creating an environment that really encourages people to get out and walk, get out and bike. I'll leave you with this last slide here, and uh, it's, it's a final slide from South Maine in uh, Buena Vista, uh, Colorado, another Dover Coal uh, development, by saying it, it really has been an absolute honor to, to be with you here today and to celebrate the amazing achievements of Victor Dover and Joseph Cole and the entire Dover Cole family extended both the, the people who are working with them now and the many organizations that have been uh, supporting their efforts and uh, partnering with them over the years. I have to give a huge shout out to Mike Leiden too. Uh, Mike actually introduced me to, to Victor many, many CNUs ago. I can't remember which one it was. It might have been Salt Lake City. Uh, thank you, Mike, for that introduction. It's been such a cherished uh, friendship uh, over these many years. And he has been, I, I have to tell you this personally, is that he has been so incredibly supportive of me being able to find my voice and be able to get this stuff out there because otherwise it's just bouncing around in my head thinking about you know, activity assets and how it impacts and improves lives. So again, thank you all so much and congratulations to Victor and Joe and the entire Dover Coal team. Thank you. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this recording of my presentation in Seaside, Florida at the Seaside Prize honoring Victor Dover and Joseph Cole. And if you did, hey, please give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring that notifications bell. And I highly encourage you all to head on over to the Seaside Institute website. Uh, check out the great programs that they have in store there, plus all the other recordings from the Seaside Weekend this year and in past years, as well as uh, an opportunity to support the Seaside Institute and the good work that they are doing. Uh, and if you're not real familiar with what the Seaside Institute is all about and Seaside Florida in general, it's a great place to start. So head on over to their website at the seasideinstitute.org. Again, thank you all so much for tuning in. And until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity activity, health, and happiness. Cheers.